You know, for a series called Mother, some of the most interesting characters from these games have to be the dads. A lot of them happen to be some of the most realistic and interesting characters found within the series, almost all in different ways. I've done analyses on a few Mother series characters before, so why not do one covering a bunch of the fathers from the series? Let's begin. I think fittingly, it'd be best to start by going over Nintendo's dad, and by extension, Ness's dad too, because even though they're separate characters, they functionally are the same and are pretty interchangeable when it comes to analysing them. Especially so considering Shigesato Itoi outright described Mother 2 before its release as having another fatherless household. Neither are ever seen during the course of Mother 1 or 2, and therefore are represented with phones. Well, Nintendo's dad does appear at the very end of Mother 1, but I'll get to that later. Both are responsible for funding you during your journey, providing excess amounts of money into your bank account so you can buy plenty of gear, grub, and anything else necessary for your adventures in these games. The heavy implication here is that they're always working and can't be home to spend time with their families very much. It's an interesting moral dilemma to consider. Are they neglectful? It's important to consider that Nintendo and Ness's dads are supposed to reflect that in many places all over the world, but particularly in Japan, it's a societal expectation that the father, the man of the house, should work hard to support their families, even if it means most of their time every day is dedicated to working. That's the reality with a lot of fathers, and it's interesting to see it portrayed in these games, of course. It seems that both fathers' roles were deliberately chosen to be a reflection of Mystery Toy's relationship with his father, as his dad was a very busy and very distant man. Despite the distance, Itoi has never expressed animosity towards his father, and I think that was his intention with Nintendo and Ness's dads. Yeah, it is sad to not see your father often, but with the knowledge that they're always just a phone call away, they'll fund your endeavors and save your progress, I think they're playing their part. Funnily enough, the pull of finally seeing the two dads at the ends of their respective games seems to be a loose reward, sort of, as you do get to see Nintendo's dad's back in Mother 1's ending, and Ness's dad promises he'll be home for Ness's birthday in a week's time. Ultimately, these two characters are pretty unimportant to the main story of Mother 1 and 2 though, as the point of those games isn't about having a strong bond with your father. On the other hand, Mother 3 changes things up a lot. One character with a very strong connection to his father is Duster, and his dad Wes. Wes is a character I've mentioned quite a few times in a lot of my other videos, but never really given him enough analysis. Wes is a single father who explicitly was someone very involved in Duster's life, teaching him the ways of thievery, and crafting and giving him thief tools. As a result of Wes's constant training, Duster gained a limp at some point growing up, or, that's how Wes recalls it, at least. Wes's faulty memory is actually one of his most interesting traits, as for anyone who's fully played Mother 3 would know about the white ship and the characters being given rewritten memories, and therefore, a lot of things that happened in the past for these characters were just fabricated. Wes being an old man, you just assume at first he has a faulty memory due to his age. For some aspects, it's never really confirmed which parts are his memory being faulty, and which ones are rewritten ones. It's entirely possible that Duster had a leg handicap before the events of the White Ship, and overworking him was something that came about from his memories being rewritten. That's all up to interpretation of course, I personally think it is more likely that Duster's limp came from Wes's overworking of him. Realistically, some parents have really high expectations of their kids, that they're willing to push them to the point where their children do end up hurt, just for the sake of their performance. And in Wes's case, Duster grows into being an adequate, strong fighter. One bit of dialogue that some people miss in Mother 3 is from the beginning of Chapter 2, where if you say no to being ready for Duster's mission, Wes acknowledges that he recalled he's the one who overworked Duster to the point of him becoming handicapped, and expresses regret for failing to raise Duster to fit in with the other villagers, and tells his son if he wants to hold a grudge against him, that he's free to do that. It's pretty interesting characterization, as I'd say it's a pretty realistic depiction of how some parents are regarding their kids when they grow up into adults. Some parents are going to recognize they didn't make all the right choices they should have, and they only show remorse after it's too late. Of course, one of the main aspects of Wes that people tend to remember is his verbal abuse towards Duster. It's pretty bad, of course. He constantly calls Duster a moron. But that's just how some parents are, as sad as it is to admit. It's a very realistic thing to depict. I don't usually like relating things back to myself, but in the household I grew up in, I dealt with my parents constantly dishing out verbal abuse to me, and to have this represented in Mother 3, I appreciate it in a weird way, knowing that this was a trope that Mystery Toy wanted to explore. 
It's really validating being reminded that there will also be people who don't appreciate when they see a parent berating their child over and over, as demonstrated with Kumatora speaking up against Wester's abuse. The way Wester's dialogue directed at Duster is written is just so interesting. Such as when Wes finally sees Duster again for the first time in three years, it really feels like it was written in a way that conveys that Wes is genuinely happy, but he just can't admit it. Maybe it's from pride, maybe it's from guilt from his verbal abuse, whatever it is, I feel like it rings true as to how some people in real life are. With Wes's verbal abuse in mind, I'd say likewise, a shockingly realistic part as well is Duster's thoughts on this, as revealed in the unused elevator dialogue from Chapter 8. Duster describes Wes as a strict but nice dad. I say this is shockingly realistic because many people who do have abusive parents still love them and will see past their abuse. It's such an interesting thing to think about knowing that Duster doesn't hold resentment towards his father. Despite his verbal abuse towards Duster, Wes is shown as pretty caring towards the other villagers in Tasmili. He shows empathy towards Flint and encourages him to be careful for the sake of Lucas and Klaus. He helps in rescuing Salsa from Facade's clutches. He shows a lot of gratefulness towards Lucas for not just saving his, Kumatora's, and Salsa's lives, but also for later finding Duster after three years, and then returns the favor when he and Alex save Lucas and Boney when they fall out of the sky. The game certainly tried to depict him as a mostly decent person despite his harshness towards his son. And you know, that's just how a lot of people are in real life too. The only other kinda weird part about him is that he seems to flirt with some of the younger women of Tasmili, which is odd since he is an old man, but I can cut him a little slack since pre-timeskip Tasmili straight up has no old women except, like, Elmore. There were gonna be a few more, but they all ended up cut from the game, so whatever. Poor Wes can't find a granny. Anyways, at the end of the day, Wes is one of the most realistic and interesting characters in Mother 3, which is saying a lot since most of the main characters in that game are masterfully well done. I do have to wonder how his reputation with fans would be any different, if at all, if he was kept as a fully playable character, as per Earthbound 64 and cut GBA Mother 3 content. Being fully playable would have perhaps given him a stronger connection to the player, rather than him just being a guest party member like in the final game, and having to seem constantly scold Duster in battle as a result. I think while some would debate Wes is the worst father of the Mother series, honestly I'd say Dr. Andernuts is a lot worse. Let's explore his role in Earthbound. Dr. Andernuts is first introduced as this legendary scientist, even greater than Einstein or Heisenberg. But you, Jeff, haven't seen him in 10 years. Not off to a great start. Why exactly you haven't seen him in a decade? No reason really. Jeff's in a boarding school, not too far away from Andronuts' lab at all. Also, Jeff is like 12 or 13, so yeah, he would pretty much not have any memories of his father. You finally see him by traveling out of the school, and for such a crazy reunion, Dr. Andronuts is pretty coy. Let's get together again in 10 years or so? What an asshole. This is his son he hasn't seen in a decade, and he has the audacity to say that to him? Also, way to go telling your son's friends that he wets the bed. Damn. If it wasn't obvious already, in my opinion, it seems Dr. Andonuts' dialogue and demeanor was written purposely to be a bit witless, likely to contrast with the gossip about his hyperintelligence. And ultimately, that is something important. Thanks in part to the contributions of the inventions of Dr. Andonuts, Ness and his friends are able to save the day. Andonuts is a helpful person, and he's definitely someone who must be a blast to work with. Apple Kid and the Mr. Saturn certainly get along with him. But Dr. Andonuts is not a good father to Jeff. Not at all. Nope. A particular bit of dialogue I think about is towards the end of the game, when you're about to activate the phase distorter. He first asks Ness to activate it. If you refuse to, he then addresses Jeff, his son, to do so. If you refuse as Jeff, in the English version he says, Oh, you lost your nerve. In the Japanese version though, he actually says something along the lines of, Y you weakling, or Y you coward. What a dick. At the very least, the ending of Earthbound finishes with a nice note that Jeff is finally going to go around and study with his dad, and finally bond his father and son. What a nice sentiment to... Oh, what's that? Oh yeah, Dr. Andernuts returns in Mother 3, so any implication that Jeff and his father can finally spend some time together is squandered by this game. Oh Itoi, you evil bastard. Dr. Andonuts doesn't once even make reference to Jeff in the game, except in an unused line of dialogue where he says Lucas reminds him of one of his son's friends. 
I guess you can give Dr. Endonuts the benefit of the doubt here, considering he's probably been brainwashed and manipulated by Porky, but it's still depressing to see. Could you imagine this all from Jeff's perspective at the end of Earthbound? You finally get the chance to connect with your dad after not even knowing him personally. And maybe he does for a good few years, but then he just vanishes. Good lord. Whatever. Dr. Andernuts is pretty spineless in Mother 3 too, so it's hard to even give him credit as someone who was doing good for the sake of the protagonists. Because the bad stuff he contributes to is just really deplorable, the good he does really isn't enough to outweigh the bad. He just sucks. Don't get me wrong, Andonuts is an interesting character, he's just a pretty irredeemable father. Even more so than Wes, in my opinion. And you know, similar to Wes, Nintendo's dad and Ness's dad, that's just how some parents are. Some parents will just send their kid off to a boarding school and barely even care about making an emotional connection with their son, in favour of focusing on their life's work. Speaking of focusing on your life's work... With Andonuts out of the way, I want to make the last major analysis of this video be someone you might not have expected, that being George from Mother 1. George isn't actually the father of a main character in the games like the other fathers in this video, he's actually the great granddad of Ninten. George is also never ever seen visually in any capacity in the game, which is understandable considering he's a long deceased man when Mother 1 takes place. So here's a fan design of him with Maria if you need a visual. Regarding purely what's in the game he's from, there's not actually a lot outright said about him. It's when you look at the supplemental material for Mother 1 that it really helps shed light on his character. Regardless, even though it takes some reading between the lines to fully understand his role, what is present in the actual game itself is still very interesting, so I'll go over that all first. So before you even begin the game, you're greeted with dialogue setting up the background of George and Maria, and it explains that the couple vanished in the early 1900s, with only George returning two years later, Maria never to be seen again. George never divulged into where they'd been or what they'd been doing, and Lowson Lee begins an odd study. Throughout the course of the game, many of the mysteries regarding both George and Maria become apparent to the player, as you learn that George studied... something... without the permission of the aliens that had abducted them, and Maria had begun to raise a baby alien named Gygus. This part in particular is kind of inconsistent between the original Japanese script, the official localization, and the encyclopedia, but George secretly studied PSI and the alien's technology without their permission while there. Upon returning to Earth, George built a giant kick-ass robot named Eve, which ultimately aids Ninten and friends in the journey of saving the kidnapped civilians, Eve being implied to have been based on the knowledge of the alien's tech that George studied unbeknownst to the aliens. Just from this information, you can gather that George is a pretty complex character. You're given only a bit of information to the point where you can fill in the gaps with your own personal interpretation. Personally, I always thought George was having tried to learn PSI for the betterment of mankind, stealing the alien's knowledge as revenge for he and Maria having been abducted, and his studies upon returning home to be in order to prevent any potential future alien attacks on Earth. With this in mind, I think the point of his character was to contrast with Maria, who displays the more nurturing side of a person, as she cares for Gygus even though he's a literal alien child. Meanwhile, George is focused on technology and the survival of the human race. While this of course is a very fantastical premise, I think Mystery Toy was trying to depict the battle of tech versus nature here in sort of an abstract way, with George representing technological achievements and aspirations of man, and Maria representing the connection between a mother and child. Seeing as oftentimes, a mother is societally expected to be more emotionally involved with children than the father, it seems Mystery Toy wanted to write a conflict around this, and he certainly made something interesting, I think. If my analysis has any merit, I suppose he toy liked the foundation of tech versus nature, seeing as that's a major theme in Mother 3. But anyways... Delving into the supplemental material for Mother 1 helps paint a bit of a stronger image of who exactly George was. A lot of it is regarding his early life and meeting Maria, so it isn't inherently too important to his role as a father. However, to summarise, George lost his parents at a very young age, became famous from his work as a newspaper reporter, moved to Podunk where he met Maria and fell in love. Then the kidnapping occurred, George returned by himself two years later and grew into a bitter old man and eventually died. Before this though, with the knowledge of the aliens inevitably returning for a future attack, he builds Eve in secret for the purpose of helping to protect the Earth. So overall, everything in the encyclopedia fits pretty in line with what was in the actual game, which makes sense since the mother encyclopedia was made as a companion piece to the game. Regarding George being a father though, 
There's still no answer as to who exactly George and Maria's child could be that would be Nintendo's grandmother or grandfather. You can infer that this unknown child was born before George and Maria were abducted by Gygus' race, as otherwise, Maria specifically may not be the biological great-grandmother of Ninten. Considering her strong attachment to Gygus, considering him to be like a son, you'd think she'd feel the same way about a biological child she'd have. So maybe George's kid was from a different mother, not Maria. At this point, this all becomes headcanon, so it's up to your personal interpretation. But with that knowledge in mind, this is an interesting case within the Mother games where Shigesatu Itoi sort of skirted over any information regarding George's relationship with his presumed son or daughter. In my opinion, there's not much to strongly suggest he was a good or bad father, really. Which in of itself, I find fascinatingly interesting. To put this in the words of Mother 1 expert Biozilla, you could make an argument that he was a bad father after he returned, as he shut himself in and devoted himself to his research. However, this was presumably for a greater cause, protecting Earth from future invasions. There is nothing to suggest that he was a bad father before the abduction. Fathers sure are interesting, huh? When it comes to the Mother series, Mystery Toy certainly did a lot in terms of making these characters interesting. To some fans though, I can understand why some of these characters kind of leave a bit to be desired, not in the sense that they're uninteresting, but that it's hard to really truly see any of these characters that I covered as very positively impactful on their children you play as. Even with Ninten and Ness's dads, yeah they give you tons of money, but they're functionally replaceable in their respective games. There's a reason why frogs are able to take their role in Mother 3. Mystery Toy was absolutely aware of this and in an effort to explore new dynamics and themes, wanted something different from the get-go for Mother 3, with Flint, the father of Lucas and Klaus, being a major character throughout the game. With this though, as Mother 3 neared release, Flint's role ended up being more similar to the previous protagonist's roles in Mother 1 and 2, with Flint being off-screen for most of the game due to a desire for a more congruent main party, eliminating the chance of seeing a Mother game where father and son bond through battle. On that note, I also think it's worth bringing up the scrapped element of Nana's father. Nana of course being a Mother 3 NPC. Her father was reportedly a sailor who went missing at sea, and from that point onwards, Nana watched and waits by the ocean for his return. The element of Nana watching the sea was kept in the final product, but with no mention of a familial connection of waiting for her father's return. Certainly I believe that would have been an interesting theme for the game to have explored, but I'm just thankful enough we know about this lore to begin with, albeit a scrapped story element. So the underlying question is, are all the dads found throughout the Mother games bad fathers? Well, not really, no. There's certainly ones that are pretty bad in a bunch of ways to their kids, including some I didn't even cover in this video. But at the end of the day, these characters were all very realistic, in line with so many elements found too in the Mother games. They're just yet another element that makes this series so unique and revered. And hey, there are some dads in these games who straight up didn't really do anything wrong either. Paula's dad is pretty nice and caring about his daughter, even if he's incompetent enough to let her get kidnapped. I think he was definitely trying his best. And with that, I've covered all the things I want to with this video. Before I end things off though, I have something special to plug. If you've been checking my community posts, you'll have seen this, but I was asked to write an article about Earthbound 64 for an English not-for-profit mother fanzine called Your Name Please. This is a collection of fan art and writings for all the mother games, a true love letter to the series. If you like me analysing different aspects from all the mother games, then you'll like my Earthbound 64 article I wrote for the zine. Pre-orders are open now until July 1st, so if you're at all interested in picking up a copy, be quick since these are made to order and won't be available after July 1st, 2023. Head to motherseriesine.bigcartel.com for more info, or check the video description. With that said, thanks very much for watching, especially all the way till the end. Have any thoughts on the fathers from the Mother series? Be sure to leave a comment if you do. If you enjoyed, feel free to like, subscribe, and check my other videos out. Until we meet again.